Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our third and final lecture on the topic of finite field methods and uh, large ANZETSA. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, functional reconstruction algorithms. And uh, this is the technology that's uh, going to allow us to put the, the large into our ANZETSA. So um, before we, we get underway, um, I just want to ask if there are, um, now that you've had uh, a day or so to, to mull, um, are there any uh, questions that have popped up? Okay. I see uh, no immediately raised hands. So it might just be that it's uh, early in the morning. Um, but uh, well, if, if these things crystallize uh, as we go along, just interrupt me. Um, or of course you can ask at the end and as David mentioned on the Slack. Okay, so uh, the content of today's lecture is going to be uh, first of all, discussing functional reconstruction algorithms. And then uh, at the very end, I will uh, come back to this uh, point that we uh, skipped at the end of the first lecture on uh, solving polynomial equations in a finite field. So um, in the previous lecture, we discussed uh, ansatzing techniques where we uh, were dealing with a uh, essentially the numerator of, of some uh, rational function uh, and uh, we, we wrote down some, some linear ansatz for it, uh, and then we solved it via sampling. And uh, in, the, in the first lecture, I wanted to argue to you that uh, it's, a, it's a good idea to do this over finite fields rather than uh, uh, floating point, because if we do it over finite fields, then we, we don't have to worry about uh, precision loss. So. Uh, what happens if you if you take this uh, project to its logical extreme and just have a bigger and bigger ansatz? Well, um, you will find that eventually you're going to run into some kind of compute time issue. Okay, the the actual um, process of fixing your ansatz uh, parameters uh, is going to become limiting. So. Uh, the the driving function uh, the driving quantity in in this setup is uh, the dimension of the function space that you're dealing with the the number of parameters that you have essentially and um, so if we think about the procedure that we undertake we uh, have to sample m plus one functions m plus one times um, and uh, we build this uh, uh, this sample matrix. So this is, uh, in principle, uh, big O of m squared operations. Uh, but this, uh, as the ansatz gets bigger and bigger, is not the, the, the complexity barrier. The complexity barrier comes from uh, doing Gaussian elimination. So when you actually try and solve uh, this matrix that you built, then uh, you uh, will find that Gaussian elimination is running as big O of m cubed, and eventually this, uh, this overtakes. So uh, an interesting question is to get a feeling about when, when is this uh, a, a limiting problem. And so uh, here is just a, a little table um, of uh, Mathematica's implementation of, of uh, Gaussian elimination in row reduction in some 32-bit finite field and uh, running on my laptop. So uh, we'll see that if our matrix is 300 by 300, then we're, we're able to solve our uh, linear system in, in less than a second. But uh, due to uh, the scaling, by the time we get to something like 2,000 by 2,000, we're, we're order one minute. And if we extrapolate this, uh, we're going to find that fixing an ansatz that has, uh, say, 24,000 terms is, is starting to need uh, one day of, of laptop time. And uh, so exactly then where the barrier is for your particular problem is going to depend on uh, 
what size of computer you have and uh, exactly what you're doing. But uh, at somewhere around this order, you're, you're going to uh, run into technical problems with uh, naive random sampling. And you, you're going to start shopping around for uh, other approaches. And uh, this is then where our functional reconstruction methodology comes into play. So uh, functional reconstruction, we can think of as a, a collection of methods from uh, computer algebra that build rational functions uh, from uh, their evaluations. So uh, it is, in essence, a, a, another form of, of doing solving an ansatz problem. Um, but it is uh, tied to uh, a situation where you have ration, a rational function of uh, independent variables. So um, if we're thinking for uh, our scattering amplitude computations, um, if we are dealing with four-dimensional uh, momenta, four-dimensional external particles, then um, some examples of problems that we can apply this to are uh, uh, if we were to think about uh, doing IBP reduction and do, uh, if we we're in a situation where we have uh, five or fewer particles, then uh, we can find an independent set of uh, Lorentz invariants. And uh, these can be taken to be our, uh, the, func uh, the variables of our rational function. Similarly, if we're constructing a differential equation matrix, we're just using IBP relations again. So. Um, as long as we haven't uh, done anything special to try and make this canonical, then again, we can uh, think in terms of, of Lorentz invariance. Now, if we um, uh, want to think uh, more, more generally in terms of uh, amplitudes, then uh, as, as was mentioned uh, at the beginning of the second lecture, we can, uh, if we're dealing with twist, twisted variables, um, then these things we can just randomly generate in principle, so there's, there's no constraint there. And uh, uh, so that would also be uh, amenable to this kind of technology. So uh, why, why would we want to use it? Well, uh, one reason is that uh, we can get away with beating the uh, big O of m cubed complexity that we find in Gaussian uh, elimination. And uh, in fact, this, this can become uh, important enough that the actual bottleneck may well become the number of samples that you, you have to uh, make of your original function. Uh, and another uh, thing that is uh, often very nice about these methods is that you can, uh, you can use them when you have no knowledge of your function other than the fact that it is a rational function of, of the input variables. Okay, so uh, we're going to be uh, then dealing with polynomials and rational functions. So uh, let's set up a little bit of uh, notation so that we can discuss this uh, more precisely. So um, uh, you will have seen uh, a multivariate polynomial uh, by now in, in Yang's course. Um, and uh, we're going to write this in the following way. So we have uh, a polynomial P which depends on uh, a number of variables, uh, x1 through xn. And uh, as it's a polynomial, it's just some linear combination of uh, monomials, which we'll write as x vector to the alpha vector, where we have some uh, coefficient p alpha. And uh, p, p alpha vector is just living in our coefficient field. And if we want a rational function, all we have to do is take a ratio of these two things. Um, and uh, the, the key uh, quantity here is that we're, we're introducing these monomials, um, x vector to the alpha vector, which is just uh, taking each of our variables, uh, x1 through xn, and uh, raising them to the uh, components of uh, our, raising them to the power of our components, uh, alpha i, okay, multiplying everything together. So as we have monomials, then these alpha i's are just, um, non-negative integers. Um, and so we can, uh, okay. So then uh, one, one thing that you might want to do with uh, your polynomial, uh, just to get some control of it, is, is to organize uh, the terms. Um, and so we can, we can talk about the, say, the total degree of, uh, of our monomial. Um, 
which is uh, simply we look at uh, a monomial, we, we look at the exponent vector and we, we sum all of the components. And then uh, if you want to talk about that in a polynomial, we just say, uh, okay, well, I look at all of the monomials and I take the total degree and, and what is the largest one? So um, one thing that's going to be uh, relevant as we go forward is, is, is understanding uh, what our multivariate polynomials start to look like. So uh, if, we, if we consider uh, a polynomial of, of uh, total degree D in, in, in our n variables, then uh, we can organize this in, in a number of ways. And, and one way that we could uh, choose to organize it is uh, uh, degree by degree. So we can uh, think of summing over uh, all degrees um, from zero up to D because we know the total degree is D. And then for each degree, we can sum over all monomials um, which have uh, a given uh, total degree, right? And uh, so if we, if we imagine that we have a polynomial that is set up in, in this way, we can ask ourselves the question, how many terms are there here? Because we're going to want to essentially use this as an ansatz. And um, you can go away and you can do a counting exercise. So if we set up um, the, the set of uh, all exponents, um, which are uh, with a total degree of uh, less than or equal to D, um, we can uh, ask how big this set is and uh, the set uh, then its cardinality is uh, for uh, up to degree d in n variables is uh, d plus n choose n. And one thing to uh, take note of here is that uh, this cardinality, the size of uh, the number of monomials involved can grow quite quickly. Um, so uh, if we imagine some, some polynomial in, uh, of degree 50 uh, in four variables, then uh, you're in a situation that you have around uh, 10 to the five terms. But if we just add one, uh, one variable, then we have 10 to the six terms. So if we're going to be treating uh, such, such a function, um, this is more than likely outside of our uh, range of being able to do naive uh, random sampling. We're going to need something more, more efficient. Okay, so one, one other thing to uh, consider about polynomials as we go forward um, is that, or, or indeed rational functions, um, uh, they, we, we may well encounter things that are homogeneous. So if you imagine that you have some polynomials in, in polynomial in your Mandelstam variables, um, then you have a mass dimension associated to this. And um, this uh, can be, considered as a homogeneous polynomial in, in your uh, Mandelstam's. So uh, in general, a, if we have some function uh, that is homogeneous, we can, uh, we can take it, uh, we can take this function f and we can uh, take an input point x and we can scale that input point by lambda. Um, and if it's homogeneous, then uh, lambda will factor out and uh, with, with some uh, particular power, okay, uh, this uh, scaling degree D. And so um, one useful thing to, to note is that uh, we can actually numerically quite easily extract this, this scaling degree. Um, but then uh, we, okay, so once we have this scaling degree, um, why, why, why would we be interested in this? And uh, the reason is, is that uh, on the previous slide, when we did our counting and we were considering our, our polynomial, we, we assumed that uh, it had terms of all degree. But in our physical applications, maybe it's homogeneous. And so um, we would be uh, waste, assuming that it has a bunch of terms that it doesn't, um, would often be uh, quite a waste of computing power. And so we can uh, use this uh, idea of the uh, scaling um, to actually uh, remove one of the variables in the following way. So we can uh, define a, some reduced function, uh, f bar, um, by taking f and just setting one of the variables to be one. Okay, so here I've picked the last variable. 
Um, and uh, we, we know, uh, because we know that uh, our original function f uh, has this uh, homo uh, degree of uh, homogeneous scaling d, um, then uh, actually we don't need to, to work with f. If we uh, have f bar and d, we have everything, we have the entire function. Um, and uh, this is just because we can take f bar, we can plug uh, the, the ratio of the, the variables back in and um, uh, pre-multiply by xn raised to the correct power, and this will uh, get us back the full function. And so in the following, we'll be able to focus on the uh, non-homogeneous case. Okay, so um, this is uh, polynomials and uh, and rational functions and, and some general notions of them. Um, what we're going to discuss next is uh, polynomial reconstruction. Um, so we're going to go for polynomials first because uh, we have to learn to walk before we can run. And uh, these techniques will then feed into uh, our rational function reconstruction problem. OK, so. Um, we're going to discuss two methods uh, in the following. Uh, the first uh, is going to solve uh, a problem of, uh, let's imagine that we have a polynomial where we, we know what the contributing monomials are. OK, so we have uh, P of x is just some sum over uh, m monomials um, labeled by uh, their exponents alpha vector i. And uh, there is an intelligent sampling approach uh, that I'll call the Vandermond approach that can solve our ansatzing problem of determining uh, these coefficients uh, in big O of m squared and uh, beating Gaussian eliminations complexity. Um, the second thing that we will discuss is uh, actually trying to <clears throat> uh, reconstruct a polynomial when we, when we don't know the uh, number of the terms that are actually appearing. So for example, where um, the, we, we don't know uh, the total degree or, or any, any degree bound. And uh, using uh, the, the, what I'll call the Newton approach, we can determine the degree bound from uh, evaluations of our polynomial. So um, we'll start off then with uh, this Vandermond approach. And uh, this Vandermond approach, uh, it works with a special choice of samples. So um, let's consider some uh, anchor point in uh, uh, x uh, in our uh, finite field. Okay, so we have x1 and xn uh, all the way up to xn uh, picked in our finite field. And uh, we're now going to consider taking the, the kth power of this thing. So um, what I mean by that is the component-wise uh, kth power. So we go into x vector, um, and we just take every element of uh, this uh, vector, and we raise it to uh, the, the kth power, and we pack that back up into, into a vector. Um, so why would we do this? Well, uh, the the, the basic reason is that this, this power map for k acts naturally on monomials. So if I imagine uh, having uh, a monomial x1 times x2 squared, if I uh, plug in uh, x1 to the k and x2 to the k, then uh, this will actually give me uh, x1 times x2 squared all raised to the power k. And uh, this is a, a general uh, feature. We can do this for any uh, monomial. And we'll see that uh, by raising, uh, by taking a monomial uh, defined uh, x to the alpha and plugging in uh, the kth power of, of x, um, all we end up with is the monomial uh, evaluated on, on the original uh, point raised to the kth power. OK, so um, well, let's imagine now uh, that we're going to uh, take a, uh, the following set of sample points. So we're going to start off with uh, our, our anchor point, which we'll call x0. Um, 
and uh, we're going to evaluate on uh, the first power, second power, all the way up to the nth power. And uh, if we do this, then uh, our sample matrix in our ANSATS problem uh, will take the following form. So uh, we have, uh, for, for each row, we have a different evaluation. For each column, we have a different function. Uh, and I am uh, every, you, we will see that the, uh, each row is a power of, of the first row. Okay, uh, increasing is uh, so first power, second power, third power, etc. Um, and uh, here we're just uh, to to make our lives a little bit uh, more compact. Uh, we're just going to call uh, the uh, elements of the the first row, which are uh, our anchor point raised to all of the powers that uh, turn up in our monomial, in our polynomial. I'm just going to call that vi. Now. You might notice uh, looking at this matrix that it looks particularly special. Um, and uh, indeed it is, and it's, uh, it's, it's so special it has a name. Um, uh, this, uh, this matrix is a, uh, is a particular type of uh, Vandermond matrix. In fact, it's a, it's a generalized transposed uh, Vandermond matrix. Um, and uh, well, why is that? Well, if we take our matrix uh, G and we look at it component-wise, then uh, GJK is just uh, VK raised to the power of J. And uh, with a matrix of this form, we can actually analytically construct the inverse. So, um, and, and this will become useful in uh, helping us efficiently invert the thing. So uh, let's uh, now consider uh, the, the following product, okay? So we're going to take our, our matrix, we're just gonna hit it with, with its inverse, and obviously this is going to give us the identity matrix. And if we, we spell this out in terms of the components, then uh, uh, we find this thing on the right-hand side. Now, if we uh, stare at uh, this on the right-hand side and just consider i and k fixed, um, then uh, because we have this jth power here, this looks awfully like a, a, a polynomial. Uh, and indeed, uh, let's um, define a, a polynomial qi of z uh, to have the following form. Um, if I just take qi of z and I plug in vk, then, then I get uh, this here. Um, so, uh, this uh, is, is very compelling because uh, now what I need to do uh, is find uh, some polynomial QI that has the correct properties such that uh, when I uh, evaluate it at the right points, I, I end up getting the, uh, the identity matrix. So this is some series of polynomials QI. So uh, what are the constraints? Well, uh, first, uh, we, we know that uh, as this is the identity matrix, QI of VK has got to be equal to zero um, when I is not equal to K. So for I not equal to K, VK is a root of QI of Z. Um, and if uh, VI is, uh, if I, if the V that you're plugging in corresponds to, to the polynomial itself, then uh, we know that we have to get one because uh, that's the diagonal entry of the uh, identity matrix. And so we can construct a special polynomial that does this. This is uh, um, quite an easy uh, task to solve because uh, we know uh, what the collection of, uh, of roots of our polynomial are. So we can just uh, build um, a polynomial of the correct degree. Um, which vanishes on uh, each of these points. So uh, we multiply all over all uh, j not equal to i. Um, uh, uh, we multiply z minus vj over all j not equal to i. And so if I plug um, some, some uh, vk in here that is not equal to i, then I'm going to get uh, one of these terms is, is uh, going to be zero and, uh, and therefore the product sets the entire thing to zero. Um, 
Now, if what happens if I uh, plug in in VI? Well, um, we see that uh, essentially what we've done here is divided uh, this uh, denominator is just the numerator evaluated on VI. And so uh, when we evaluate on VI, we're going to get one. Um, and in this way, this polynomial uh, QI of Z is uh, exactly the, the correct polynomial that we need such that its coefficients are uh, going to give us the, the inverse matrix. So uh, that's very nice, it's very special. Um, now, if we go away and we try to uh, use this formula to actually build the inverse matrix, it turns out that uh, uh, every time you expand uh, this polynomial to get its coefficients, it takes n squared operations. So if you do it uh, for, for each of the polynomials, this is going to take a big O of uh, n cubed operations, which is no improvement on our Gaussian elimination. However, we can, we can see uh, that this is essentially the, uh, uh, most of the operations that you're doing in this multiplication are the same for every value of i. And so there, there's, a, there's a clever way to, um, to achieve uh, a better complexity. Uh, so to do this, we're going to uh, construct a polynomial capital G, uh, sorry, um, curly Q um, of Z uh, that we'll call uh, our master polynomial. And uh, this is just uh, going to multiply over all of the roots now. Um, and uh, this, uh, okay, again, we can, uh, we can build all of its, uh, we can expand this thing out in, in M squared operations. Uh, but then we can use it uh, to build um, our, uh, our coefficient, our particular polynomials QI. Uh, and we, we can do this by uh, using polynomial division. Okay, so if we just uh, take this polynomial and we divide it uh, by uh, the root that we, we don't want to vanish at, then we're going to get the numerator of, the, uh, of, of QI from the other uh, from the previous slide. And so uh, the only thing that we need to do is make sure that this is properly normalized. And um, to do this, then we just uh, divide by uh, this polynomial evaluated on that point. So uh, with this form, QI of VI is just one. And this is something that you can also do in, in uh, big O of M operations uh, and allows you to construct the the inverse in uh, big O of M squared operations. So um, then uh, once you have uh, this, uh, these polynomials, okay, we, we just uh, take their coefficients because uh, in Z, because their coefficients are, are just giving us the components of the inverse matrix. And uh, this allows us to uh, extract our ansatz coefficients uh, P alpha i, um, all, we, all we need to do is take our original polynomial and evaluate it on uh, the various powers of, of x and uh, contract it with uh, our inverse matrix. Okay, so um, that was the, the Vandermond approach, um, which allows us, uh, if we have some, some knowledge from, from somewhere else about uh, uh, which terms are contributing? Maybe, for example, we know we know the degree. Um, then uh, we we can apply uh, that approach. But uh, what about if we if we don't know the degree? Well, uh, or, or or we have no uh, no knowledge other than the fact that we have a polynomial. Well, this is uh, where we can apply Newton's approach. So Newton's approach uh, is uh, a uh, another interpolation uh, approach. Uh, so, and uh, for the moment, we're just going to focus on uh, the univariate case because uh, as we, uh, once we've done this, we'll see that there's a very natural way to build a multivariate algorithm. From it. So let's uh, just consider a polynomial P uh, of degree D, and this has, uh, We've got some coefficients here at ci of uh, our various monomials x to the i. And what this approach tells us to do um, or, or is that uh, it tells us that x to the i, if 
we want to do this interpolation is, is a bad space of our, a bad basis of our monomial space. And instead, what you should do is pick a basis which is tailored to uh, sample points. So um, uh, we have here, uh, in principle, we have a degree D polynomial. So um, we need D plus one sample points. Uh, and now, uh, before you start, you may not know the degree, but um, we're just going to assume one for the moment and we'll see that we'll be able to, to correct our assumption. Um, so uh, we, we work with, we have some working, uh, working value of the degree D. Um, and uh, we're going to use, uh, take our polynomial and we're going to put it into uh, the, this basis QI of X. Uh, and QI of X are um, designed so that uh, they, they vanish on, uh, well, QI of X are uh, simply the product of X minus X to the J where J is less than I. And this means that um, QI uh, actually vanishes on uh, any XJ for which J is less than I. And so um, if we then uh, think about the, the constraints that we, we start building uh, on, on these coefficients as we go ahead and sample, um, it's uh, clear that as the basis functions themselves are, are vanishing on on the points, on the evaluation points um, uh, um, up until a certain stage, then uh, the ith coefficient is not constrained up until uh, a certain number of evaluations. So uh, in this way, uh, what it means is if, if we have, if we take some, some uh, candidate uh, value of D um, and we uh, are able to show that we've, we've picked the, the wrong value of D, um, then we can just uh, increase uh, D in a, in a very painful way, a painless way, because we haven't um, had to, uh, we haven't constrained uh, the coefficient of the next uh, basis function. So essentially with this form of ansatz, we're able to efficiently extend the ansatz if D is too small. Um, so this kind of uh, ansatzing procedure, you can actually wrap up into uh, uh, a simple algorithm um, where uh, we can compute the coefficients uh, here at C bar n uh, via um, divided differences. Uh, and so uh, what, what we can do is that uh, essentially uh, there, there is a you can write it in a recursive uh, manner, which might be useful if you want to implement this sort of thing in, in Mathematica that likes recursion. And um, we, we introduce uh, some, some quantity uh, BKN. Uh, we relate this to uh, our original coefficient. And uh, we can see that uh, we uh, can use this recursion to uh, take some evaluation of the polynomial uh, and turn the wheel uh, until we get uh, the evaluation of uh, its, its coefficient, which is given only in terms of the, the previous, uh, previous coefficients and previous evaluation points. So um, the question becomes then, uh, if we have some, if we've picked some value of D, um, how do we how do we know uh, if it's correct, and how do we know if we should uh, we should keep going and, and increase D and, and just turn the wheel and keep adding more evaluations and more uh, more coefficients? Well, this is where the uh, Schwartz Zippel framework uh, from from the beginning comes in, because uh, it tells us that if we if we evaluate on uh, our nth uh, point, and we find that the function that we have reconstructed uh, gives us the same uh, gives us the same value. Well, as long as the cardinality of my finite field was large enough, um, then Schwarzschild is telling us that this can be no accident, right? Uh, the probability of, of this being an accident uh, we can make arbitrarily small, and so uh, this gives us a, a strong belief that we really have the correct function. 
So um, we can then uh, take our uh, set of coefficients and uh, you might be worried that this sort of thing will then uh, going back to canonical form could could break uh, any efficiency gains and um, it turns out not to be the case because we can rearrange our, our ANZADs a little bit into this, this nested form. And uh, what we can do to, to rebuild the polynomial is to start from the innermost nesting. Um, so imagine here that uh, we, we only needed uh, four coefficients. So we, we invoke uh, up to C3 bar and then it stops. And then we would take C3 bar, we would multiply it by X minus X2, we would expand that and add C2 bar. We would multiply this thing by X minus X1, expand that and add C1 bar, et cetera, et cetera. And in this way, we can take these coefficients uh, CM bar and rebuild our, our full polynomial. Now, um, one thing to uh, point out is that Mathematica has uh, an implementation of uh, the, this interpolation procedure already um, uh, that allows you to extract something in, in this form. Uh, if you just go and look uh, for interpolating polynomial, uh, then this will do uh, a lot of the job for you. And of course, uh, it also has uh, its uh, a modulus parameter. So um, this uh, approach then allows us to take some uh, univariate polynomial that we uh, don't know before, uh, we don't know the degree of before we start, and, and simply through evaluations manages to, to work out its, its analytic form, including uh, the degree. So that was the univariate case. Um, can we do a similar thing for the multivariate case? Because we, uh, in physics, we're often going to be dealing with multivariate uh, functions. Um, and we, we may not know that any uh, bound on the degree there either. Excuse me, Ben. Hi. Uh, go uh, ahead, Gabriel. Can, can I make you a question? Uh, so you could mm -hmm. go back to the previous slide. Yeah. So what, what do you mean by um, if uh, the it, match, uh, it matches reconstruction? So you, you evaluate on more points and you see if uh, the function give the right result or that, that is a, that is exactly what i mean oh, right okay sorry so okay. yeah yeah that's, that's good no so um if uh you you will build um a a function after um d plus one evaluations then you will have uh, a a polynomial of degree d um uh of uh, um, well, we can stick with with this form, um, and then you can just take uh, this polynomial that you have built and uh, evaluate it. Uh, you then go to the next uh, point. Uh, you take the polynomial that you have built. You evaluate that on on that point, and then you also evaluate the 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 true function, your target function, on that point, and and you compare the two. Okay, and as long as the finite field is big enough, it's just enough to see one point and or, or, or so, at least like is enough to one point not to match and since if everything is exact you know it, it you have to keep going but so but if it matches, uh, uh, right right so um for for some people i mean you you can actually um do the analysis uh and uh the the probability improve probability bound improves uh as you uh, add more and more uh, evaluations um and uh, so, but but nevertheless, even after one evaluation, it's it's bounded by one over p, um, um, order one over p. So if um, p is large enough, that, um, uh, this uh, this is uh, enough to work in practice uh, very very well. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so. Um, as I was saying, we might want to uh, work with multivariate polynomials. And uh, multivariate polynomials, um, we, we may not know the, the degree there either. Uh, but uh, so, so how, how can we uh, deal with this problem? Well, uh, what we can do is look at an n-variable polynomial 
as a univariate polynomial with coefficients that are n minus one variable polynomials. So um, using this uh, polynomial ring notation, we can, we can take our uh, polynomial in n variables and uh, work out the, uh, with a coefficient uh, in some field. And this is, uh, can be seen uh, if I, for example, just focus on xn, um, you can see this is a polynomial in xn whose coefficients are in the polynomial ring of n minus one variables. And um, this uh, observation uh, is, uh, gels very well with um, the, the Newton uh, algorithm uh, in the univariate case. And, and the reason for this is that if we, if we look back to the slide, um, we will see that uh, when, we, when we apply this uh, recursion, when we uh, go through these steps, the only time we ever divide is by uh, evaluations, uh, the actual choice of input point. And so um, the, uh, this uh, formula works equally well if the output of um, the, poly uh, the polynomial evaluation is itself a polynomial uh, in uh, a ring whose associated coefficient field uh, is the same field. So, um, to put this in another way, uh, we can uh, basically apply the univariate Newton interpolation recursively. Um, and uh, by that, we can say, I have some uh, polynomial in n variables, um, uh, and I can take my, my Newton, uh, univariate Newton basis, uh, and I can express my polynomial in n variables uh, uh, in, this, in this basis, such that the coefficients C bar are now polynomials in, in uh, the rest of the variables. And uh, this, uh, uh, what, and then what we can do is simply uh, apply some polynomial reconstruction algorithm to the coefficient C bar, okay? This is an N minus one variable polynomial, so we can uh, target this with a reconstruction algorithm. And this reconstruction algorithm can, of course, then be our multivariate Newton algorithm. And so we can just recurse our way all the way down to uh, a single variable where we uh, know that uh, we have the univariate Newton algorithm. And uh, so uh, we, are, we can apply that. Um, and so what I, what I want to highlight here is that we, we have some, some general principle of uh, composing reconstruction algorithms. So if we, if we have, uh, all we've really done here is uh, taking the univariate algorithm and composed it with itself enough times to get an N variable algorithm. Okay, so um, this brings me to the end of discussing polynomial reconstruction. Um, I'm now going to move on to, to rational functions. Um, are there any uh, other questions uh, at this stage? Maybe a quick question. So go ahead, please. On this, so this last method that you describe, it feels like it's gonna scale pretty badly as soon as the these become large, right? Because at each new iteration, you have to do the same thing, but say m times with like lower degree polynomials. So um, in in practice. Uh, the the degree in each variable uh, is is likely to to not be that large um, because if you imagine uh, that you say have a uh, some some polynomial uh, of well okay if you imagine that you have a polynomial total degree uh, fifty in five variables then the individual degree is ten and ten is still not that large a number. Um, and uh, in, in practice, what you see is that uh, this approach is, is very efficient. You don't really no notice um, that uh, uh, in, 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 in a number of applications, this is not the limiting factor at all. I see. Uh, OK, thanks. Anything else before we uh, move on?
Okay, cool. So um, let's then talk about rational functions. So rational functions are, uh, are uh, plainly more complicated than, than polynomials because uh, we have two of them, right? And one of them is living in the denominator. Um, and uh, so uh, as, as we said before, we can, we can just consider a rational function as uh, a, uh, a ratio of, of two polynomials and, and we can use uh, this notation for that. Um, but uh, we, we come to uh, having uh, a new issue, which is that uh, uh, in comparison to the polynomial world, we need to determine this, this denominator. Uh, and there are sort of two uh, solutions currently uh, on the market for physicists. Uh, the first uh, is if we uh, have some idea about what this denominator is, is likely to be. So if we, if we have some uh, ansatz for, for the factors. Um, uh, and the, the second thing that we can, uh, the, the other approach that we have is uh, a, uh, a general functional reconstruction approach where we again say we know nothing about D and we don't know its degree, we don't know um, its factors. Uh, and we are um, going to just uh, again take a, a black box interpolation problem. Now, uh, both of these approaches end up uh, requiring um, us to uh, work with uh, being able to reconstruct uh, some univariate rational function of, of unknown degree. So that's where we're going to start. Um, so, uh, what is a univariate rational function? Well, uh, we're going to want to make this an ansatz. Uh, so we're going to uh, need to be uh, very precise about uh, making this uh, unique, as we will see. So um, if we consider some univariate rational function f of x, uh, which is uh, just some polynomial of uh, degree r over a polynomial of degree s. So if I, if I just tell you this, um, I, I haven't yet made uh, my rational function unique. Um, and the reason for this is that I can uh, multiply numerator and denominator by the same thing, and I get the same rational function. So uh, the first thing that we're going to uh, require for uh, a unique ansatz is that the, uh, there is no polynomial uh, that uh, actually multiplies both n and d simultaneously. Um, and uh, so um, one way to state this is that uh, there is uh, the, in our ansatz, we require that the greatest common divisor of uh, n and d is just uh, some uh, constant polynomial one. Um, now, uh, however, there is another um, uh, kind of rescaling that we can do, which is just by an element of the field, okay? Um, so we can take n and d and we can rescale them by lambdas, uh, some lambda in the field, and, and uh, this will also give us the same rational function. Um, and so to, to, to knock out this degree of freedom as well in order to, to make us unique so that we have a single answer to our ansatz problem, um, we're going to uh, make an arbitrary choice and, and fix the, uh, one of these uh, coefficients in n, uh, specifically uh, the uh, lowest, uh, the coefficient of the lowest degree in the denominator, we're going to fix this to be one. Um, and in this way, uh, we, we, we've made some canonical choice for, for lambda and, and remove this freedom. Okay, so um, if, we, if we take this as an ansatz, um, this looks quite different to our, our linear ansatzing problem from, from the previous uh, from the previous slides, because uh, sorry, from the previous lecture, um, because I, I have some uh, ansatz parameters sitting both in the uh, numerator and in the denominator, and in the denominator. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, you, you might be worried that this is uh, not a problem that I can actually solve by linear algebra anymore. Um, but there, there is a trick that allows us to um, to get away with this. So uh, what we can do is take our, our rational function and simply multiply our ansatz and we can multiply it by D. 
Um, and then if we take all of the terms which have uh, ANSATS parameters and move them to the right-hand side, uh, we'll find that uh, we, we have something uh, of a more familiar form where we have some function uh, that lives in some, uh, some space. Uh, and uh, so if we happen to know uh, the degrees R and S, um, then uh, we're golden and we really uh, can just apply linear algebra. So this then brings us to uh, a very similar question that we had in, in the polynomial case. What if I don't know the degrees? Um, and for this, we can use Tila interpolation. So Tila interpolation is going to look very similar to, to Newton interpolation. Um, and we're going to make basically the same arguments. So um, the, the, the trick of Tila interpolation is to take uh, a univariate rational function uh, f of x and uh, put it in a continued fraction form. So uh, we take f of x and uh, we see that uh, uh, we are able to write it as uh, uh, a continued fraction form. So this is some, some nested set of uh, uh, additions, uh, multiplications, and, and, and divisions, essentially. And um, if we look at this form, uh, then this form is, is quite useful because uh, it has a very similar property to, to the Newton setup, where if we evaluate it on a given uh, point, uh, say uh, x1, then uh, a whole slew of our uh, param ANSATS parameters simply don't uh, turn up. And so uh, with this uh, formulation, uh, we uh, we are able to uh, play the same kind of uh, game of extending our, our ansatz, right? So um, we, we can uh, see that only uh, if I evaluate it on some point xn, then uh, only uh, the an turn up for n less than or equal to n. And, and we can then uh, say, okay, well, let's, let's just pick some, some n and uh, we can play this cross check again cross-check game again, and uh, every time we see that it's wrong, uh, we can just extend uh, the, the ANSATS. So uh, a couple of uh, maybe implementation notes uh, for, for this formula. Um, Mathematica, of course, uh, has, has uh, the ability to uh, give you something in this continued fraction form uh, with uh, a single function. Uh, and but more than likely, you're going to want to uh, go back to your original form, uh, your canonical form, and indeed we will. Uh, so uh, you can, you will probably know the function together, but together, um, as is becoming a theme of these lectures, uh, also has a, a modulus option. Okay, so how, how do we compute uh, the coefficients a n? Well, we can do this using uh, inverse differences. Uh, and so now we have uh, a formula um, for a n in terms of these phi k n that looks very, very similar to the one that we had in the Newton case. And in fact, it's basically the same, but here there's uh, the numerator and denominator have been flipped. Um, so we can again play the same kind of game of uh, taking our evaluation uh, at some point uh, and feeding it through the recursion uh, allowing us to build up uh, the nth coefficient uh, a n. And uh, again, this only depends on, on the previous uh, evaluations. And, and this is uh, the feature that allows us to extend our, our ansatz. So as I say, this is very uh, strongly analogous to, to uh, the Newton setup just now with rational functions. And we have the exact same argument um, about uh, when when we should stop, right? We just take the function, uh, evaluate it on on a new point, and uh, compare this. I subtract it from uh, the uh, reconstructed function on that point and see if we get zero. Okay, so similarly, uh, we have a uh, as a, a simple way to convert this back to canonical form and. You might notice that this uh, 
this looks very, very similar to, to the Newton formulation. That's just now that we have uh, some, some reciprocals that we have to take as we go along. So one thing to uh, take into account as we uh, go, go forward is that uh, if you were to, to implement uh, Taylor's formula, if you want to uh, go back to a canonical form of your rational function, which we will, um, then uh, it doesn't immediately come out of this formula that the coefficient of the uh, lowest degree term in the denominator is, is one. So we have to enforce this. Okay, so this uh, allows us to, um, to compute, uh, reconstruct a rational function uh, of a single variable. So now we're going to go on to the first application of this algorithm, um, which will allow us to determine uh, a, the, the denominator of uh, a, a rational function in a situation where you have uh, an ansatz for the factors. So we know uh, that in physical uh, situations, the denominator very much often does factorize, right? We, we, we've seen in the project that uh, our, our denominator is, is it's not some arbitrary polynomial of the spinners, but um, a product of, uh, of interesting functions. And so uh, maybe, maybe before you, you start playing your, your ansatzing games, you, you have some uh, guess for uh, the denominator factors or, 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 or some, some well-motivated ansatz. And uh, the, so, the, so where, where might you have gotten this from? Well, for example, you, you might expect in, in, in a physical amplitude that the uh, denominators are coming from, from factorization. Um, or alternatively, um, or maybe uh, complementarily, uh, you, uh, you note that uh, your integrals have uh, spurious singularities um, uh, coming from the symbol letters, and, and these would also be uh, good candidates for the denominators. So um, we, we then work uh, in, in, the, in the following, assuming that we have some a uh, good uh, set of denominator factors, uh, this uh, fancy D here. And uh, so with uh, what we're going to do uh, is to apply uh, Taylor's univariate uh, algorithm. But we have a multivariate rational function. So how are we going to do this? Well, um, the uh, idea is, is that we're going to make a, a BCFW shift. Um, um, it's going to make a particular form of a BCFW shift um, uh, where we shift all of, of the lines. Uh, so um, a BCFW shift has, has a natural univariate parameter Z. And uh, the particular, and, and this is going to be the parameter we focus on in, in our uh, univariate function. So the particular shift that we're going to be making is uh, I goes to uh, I, so we take the uh, angle spinner and we uh, shift it by uh, Z times UI times some reference spinner X, where we're leaving uh, UI floating. And we do the same thing for a, a square spinner. Um, now, if we do this uh, where our floating parameter is VI, and if we do this for arbitrary uh, values of ui and bi, then we're not going to have momentum conservation uh, uh, generically. The shifted configuration is not going to uh, give us a good configuration, uh, a good phase space point. So uh, we need to uh, ensure momentum conservation. And uh, we're going to do this uh, in, in a very, uh, in, in, in what my, by now might well be becoming a standard way. Um, we're going to do it randomly and, and, and arbitrarily. So uh, to fix momentum conservation, uh, all we need to do is find uh, ui and vi that solve these, these equations. So um, we, uh, we want uh, random solutions. And, and the way that we can get this is we can notice that uh, this is essentially a, a linear equation on, on the UI, um, which uh, says that uh, we need U, UI are defining some linear combination of the square spinners that gives us zero. 
And so um, this is just a, a null space equation, and we can ask for um, some, some random element in, in the finite field uh, of that null space. Uh, and then we can take that element and we can uh, plug this uh, into the remaining equations. Uh, and we will again get some linear equations in the VI, uh, which we can just uh, solve, uh, which again uh, will be some null space equation. And we can just uh, take some, some random point in that space. So once we found UI and VI that satisfy these equations, um, we can. Uh, we, what we have is some family of, uh, moment of, of uh, phase space configurations parameterized by, by Z. And uh, our uh, coefficient then, uh, uh, we can, or, or our rational function, we can take to be uh, a univariate rational function of, of Z. So we're, got, we're, we're working um, with uh, everything, uh, at least in, in our mind's eye, with everything other than Z here being uh, numeric. And uh, the, the idea is then that we're going to uh, get this uh, uh, univariate analytic form in, in Z for, uh, for numeric, uh, for all of the rest of the parameters numeric uh, by applying Tila's algorithm to uh, this coefficient. So we're, we're just going to be sampling it in, in Z and using Tila's algorithm. So if we do this, um, then we, uh, this allows us to do something very powerful because uh, we know that our coefficient uh, by ansatz has a factorizing denominator. And so um, our, our target then is to um, extract the uh, various uh, exponents alpha j. Uh, so we go away and we take our, our rational function, our coefficient, and uh, we, we do um, uh, as, as Tila tells us to, and we sample it on uh, a, a sufficient number of points until uh, we have reconstructed the uh, analytic form in Z. And so, we have a rational function where the uh, we just have uh, these nj and dj uh, all live uh, numerically in a finite field, uh, and uh, importantly, we we have some some constant here because uh, we started off with a uh, phase space configuration uh, for which z equals zero um, was was non singular, um, and uh, if we compare uh, this form of our rational function to to this form. Um, well, uh, we'll notice that uh, this factorizes. Um, so this must tell us that uh, our univariate rational function also factorizes. Um, so if we, if we go away and we uh, take our, our now, um, our form of this uh, denominator that Tiller has given to us, we'll find that uh, if we factorize it, we'll be, uh, we actually will get a, a bunch of uh, non-trivial factors. And so from this factorization, then we're going to be able to extract the various uh, powers alpha j. So all we have to do is uh, take our factorized denominator uh, in z uh, and, and simply compare it against the various uh, factorized uh, dj of z. So one thing to uh, take into account is that when we when we do this factorization procedure, okay, it's going to push us into some canonical form uh, where um, our dj of z, which is some uh, polynomial in z, uh, factorizing it will, um, uh, in full generality, give us a product of uh, various uh, a product of various uh, polynomials raised to some exponents, but uh, here uh, this is not too important. The thing I want to focus on uh, as uh, a technical point is that when we do this, we'll get some overall factor kappa j. Um, and uh, if we compare the denominator here and the denominator here, there is no um, overall factor in, in the denominator. And this is because we have uh, in our canonical definition of the univariate function, we've normalized it away. So um, what we have to do then is just compare uh, this, oh, uh, every part of uh, curly, uh, curly D without kappa J against the various factors in, in C, 
in the denominator of C as n. So um, uh, now there's been one implicit thing as we've uh, been discussing that uh, we can actually factorize a, a polynomial uh, over a finite field. Uh, and indeed, uh, once we get to uh, the final part, then uh, we'll see how, uh, we'll, we'll see the rudiments of how this is achieved. Okay, so uh, that was one application of our univariate rational function reconstruction, um, where uh, we, we assumed that we, we knew um, or, or had some uh, feeling for, sorry, and where we, where we had an ansatz for uh, the denominator factors. Um, but we may not uh, know uh, these denominator factors before we start. Okay, so um, you could imagine that uh, you're, you're trying to construct a table of IPP relations and uh, you just don't know the denominator factors. Um, so then we have to work again, uh, we have to work with a general rational function. Uh, and in this situation, um, the, uh, we're, we're going to have to repeat our, our analysis of uh, canonicality, okay, of making it unique. Um, that we did in the univariate case. So uh, we have some uh, ratio of, of two polynomials. Um, and again, we're going to have to, to keep it unique. We have to make sure that there's no uh, common divisor between the two things. Now, the trickier part here is, is the rescaling freedom that we had in the univariate case. Um, and, and, and we have here also. Uh, in the univariate case, uh, we were able to, there was a pretty reasonable canonical choice of, of going through and uh, take uh, saying, well, fix one of the coefficients, uh, specifically one in the denominator to be, uh, the, to be one in order to um, remove this rescaling uh, freedom. And we, we did that by picking something uh, based on, on the degree. Um, now in the multivariate case, uh, you, there's, there's not, necessarily an obvious term that you would want to give uh, the, the this unit co coefficient because um, multivariate orderings are, are somewhat uh, com more complicated. Um, in the following, we're going to uh, avoid this problem. Uh, we're going to avoid it by uh, assuming that uh, our uh, denominator polynomial has uh, a constant term uh, and we're uh, in any given multivariate ordering, uh, the constant piece is always going to be the lowest. And so uh, we are, we're going to take that as uh, our way of uh, setting that to one um, as our way of removing this rescaling freedom. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, we hope that uh, we, we noticed that we can uh, Think about composing these functional reconstruction algorithms. And we would like to, uh, as we head towards multivariate rational functions, we would like to, uh, now that we have a univariate rational function algorithm uh, from, from, from TILA, uh, we'd like to compose that with a multivariate polynomial algorithm. And if we can, we're going to get a, an algorithm that allows us to determine uh, a multivariate rational function from its samples. So, um, well, um, can we take a similar style of perspective from before, uh, where we consider a rational function in uh, n variables as a univariate rational function with uh, polynomial coefficients? So, um, indeed, this is a, this is a good way to to describe a, a rational function. Um, so if I imagine uh, I focus on one variable xn, um, then uh, I all if I look at my rational function in its uh, numerator over denominator form, um, it will uh, uh, I'll be able to uh, focus on xn and see that uh, all of its coefficients are, are polynomials in in the remaining variables. Um, however. Uh, when we want to play this game of, of composing the algorithms, uh, this way of looking at the, at the function uh, doesn't uh, connect well with the fact, with our univariate rational function canonical form. 
because in the canonical form for the univariate rational function, um, we are required that the uh, sum term that we picked to be uh, the lowest degree term in the denominator has a unit coefficient. And so uh, this is um, uh, what we're getting out of Tila. Um, but here, this is not something that we can we can achieve because uh, the the denominator, the coefficient of uh, xn to the zero, uh, may well be um, a a polynomial in the remaining variables, and and I cannot divide uh, by a polynomial uh, and still end up with the same form. So uh, naively, this is this is a problem, but we can uh, get around this by uh, rescaling and, and shifting. Uh, so so uh, we can, we can uh, we'll, we will see now that we can take this perspective of composing things, but we have to um, play a little game. So um, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is to, uh, as I said, uh, reduce to the case where I have uh, a, a unit coefficient in uh, a unit, a degree zero polynomial, um, degree zero monomial in my denominator polynomial. Um, so we're going to make sure that uh, this, this term d0 um, is not equal to zero. And we can do this by just making some arbitrary random shift uh, in uh, our function. Okay, so uh, as uh, we're making some arbitrary choice of this shift, the uh, denominator um, sh should well not, uh, that there should be a uh, constant term in the denominator because this is this point is not um, a, a an interesting point for our function. Um, so once we've done this, uh, what we can do is uh, introduce an auxiliary function. So uh, and, and we're going to work uh, in principle with with this auxiliary function. It's called HR uh, of uh, and it depends on t and x. So we're introducing a new variable. Um, and given that uh, we know that uh, we have a constant piece, um, uh, we can introduce a new variable in a, in a useful way by uh, taking our original uh, function r and uh, multiplying every input variable by some uh, parameter, by, by this parameter t. Um, and if we now think about what happens to our general uh, rational function, we'll see that uh, we, uh, if we think about organizing our rational function uh, in this total degree, uh, uh, by degree in this way uh, that we had earlier on in the lecture, what happens is that every uh, uh, sub piece of a, a given degree uh, gets an, a factor of t to the i. Okay, because uh, as we've uh, plugged this in in, a, in, a, in the same way for every uh, monomial, uh, so for every variable, then um, this will just factor out. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, if we then uh, look at, at this function, then uh, we will find that this function, uh, hr of t, comma, uh, t and x vector, um, really does uh, look uh, as a univariate function in T, uh, like our canonical form of, so uh, we have uh, a, a constant piece in the denominator and, um, uh, and something that then is uh, a, a univariate function, rational function in T. And further, every coefficient of some power of T uh, is a, uh, multivariate polynomial. Um, and this then means that we can apply our composition strategy. So the coefficients of t to the m are uh, multivariate polynomials and we can apply polynomial reconstruction. Now, one thing that you uh, might, might look at this and go and start complaining is that I just introduced a new variable and earlier on, I was trying to argue that um, if you have more variables, then your problem becomes more complicated. 
Um, but here we see that uh, the, uh, what we've done is that the coefficients of TTM are homogeneous polynomials in, in uh, our uh, variables X. And so uh, we can also appeal to the uh, homogeneous uh, polynomial technology that we had at the beginning um, to essentially set one of the variables here to one again. Um, and uh, this will uh, this counteract the, the complexity increase of introducing a new variable. Okay, so um, in this way, we have uh, managed to reduce our multivariate rational function construction problem to uh, the composition of uh, a univariate rational function algorithm and a um, and a multivariate polynomial algorithm. Um, and uh, this uh, brings me to the end of the rational function section. Um, Christoph is uh, already asking a question, so please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so usually you want to um, reconstruct multiple rational functions with, so, so with one evaluation, you will get like an array of um, rational yeah. function evaluations, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, different rational functions might require here a different shift, right? To get this um, constant um, piece in the denominator. So you- uh, Yes, sorry, go on. Um, uh, which is generally not really a problem because you can do this shift after you evaluate the function. But now if you, if you introduce this T variable, I think your your evaluation points are, are kind of special, right? You, you need to have special evaluation points that are kind of scaled by t. So so my question is, can you can you also still do the shift after the evaluation? Because otherwise you would have to to choose different evaluation points for different rational functions, so that you you can. Um, so so. Um... The, the first thing that I, I would want to say is uh, that um, this, this R here is, uh, is, is meant to be the shifted function, right? So I shift first and then um, I, uh, and, and then I do the rescaling. Uh, and so, uh, and, and the important, the reason why this is uh, so essentially important is that if you don't do the shift first, um, the, uh, if you imagine taking uh, some function uh, x over x plus y, uh, and then you do the rescaling, then uh, some factor of t is just going to cancel between the numerator and denominator, right? Um, and uh, this is not actually giving you uh, a, a, a useful form for you to do the reconstruction because you haven't correctly separated things. So um, uh, the, um, the way that uh, you should approach this uh, is that you uh, you make one uh, one shift for all functions simultaneously, um, because I, I I also agree that uh, in practice um, you're applying this not to a single function, but uh, as we're dealing with master integral coefficients, often we have many of these, and so you need to. Um, uh, you, you need to be able to deal with uh, many simultaneously. But because the shift is chosen randomly, um, uh, in this particular situation, uh, you, you don't need to uh, worry about the fact that different functions might need different shifts. Now, you, you can get more advanced, um, and uh, the, there is, uh, I, maybe this is the kind of thing that you're worrying about, um, there is uh, a, uh, there are, so the techniques we've been discussing here are for so-called dense functions. Um, and these, uh, this, this means that we, we've sort of uh, moved the function around quite a lot. Uh, and in principle, that would spread terms everywhere. Um, but because we're assuming that the, the function had uh, a lot of non-zero terms, we don't mind. Um, if the function is sparse, then the act of making the shift so if I imagine I have a function uh, that is just x to the seventh, and then I uh, go from uh, I shift x goes to x minus 92, this will turn a function with one term into a function with eight terms. And this is a bad idea. And there are um, uh, uh, other algorithms uh, 
uh, out there um, that try to uh, make use of the sparsity. Um, and, and there, yes, it's, it's going to become more complicated to, uh, to play this uh, shift game. Um, but, but in the case that I'm uh, presenting here, uh, you, you can definitely solve the, the problem of reducing it to a rational function of construction by making a random shift. You know, um, my, my uh, question was for more like, um, so you answered it already, but my question was just related because you would have to find one shift that um, makes sure in all rational functions that you have this constant piece and denominator. And I was worried that you yeah. might not find this one shift. Mm. But of course, so, it's uh, random. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, it's, it's quite easy to find in practice um, and also to check because the, the point is, is that uh, if you have uh, a, if the shift um, is bad, what you will essentially have is a non-constant term in the denominator. So if you evaluate the shifted function at the origin, you will end up dividing by zero. And so your, your implementation is going to tell you that, ah, no, um, that was no good. Um, so you can, it, you can do a search basically for a good shift. Um, and if your shift is random, then in practice, you find that your search succeeds after one shift. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, Guy, please go ahead, but uh, we're I definitely running out of time. <laughs> I, I thought the all line shift guarantees that you have um, good large Z behavior. Um, ah, okay. So, so um, I, I must. Uh, that is an interesting question. I I must point out that like this uh, shifting of a rational function here and the uh, BCFW shift that we were um, discussing are really um, two different applications. Okay. So, so I I don't want uh, this this zeta here and uh, the um, shift that we did before are are unrelated. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, well, let's uh, try uh, to quickly go over um, the final piece of material, um, which is uh, the um, discussing uh, how we can actually in practice uh, solve uh, some arbitrary polynomial equation uh, in one variable in a finite field. We saw this uh, at the, uh, in the first lecture um, that uh, we might need to take some square roots uh, and uh, uh, I then uh, basically said, oh, Mathematica can do this. Uh, so how, how, if, uh, how is it actually achieving this? Um, uh, how could you do this yourself if you wanted to? Well, so our problem is uh, trying to uh, find a root of a, a, a polynomial Q of X in a finite field. And uh, so this is finding some X, all of the XI, um, in the finite field that set Q of Xi to zero. And uh, the uh, way that we're going to, to approach this is to note that this problem of root finding is, is uh, intimately linked to factorizing polynomials. So if I have a root, then I can show that uh, that means that I can actually factor my polynomial as X minus Xi times by Qi of X. So uh, let's think about factorizing polynomials and what happens. Well, because our finite field is not algebraically closed, I can't necessarily factor into linear polynomials. And linear polynomials are the ones that are going to tell me about the roots. So in general, um, our uh, polynomial Q of X is uh, some uh, will factor uh, into the following form. I have some big Q of X uh, and uh, the, uh, then there will be some uh, other piece, which is uh, simply a product of all of the roots um, of our original polynomial. So x minus xi, where x is, xi is a root, uh, counted with multiplicity. And uh, our uh, polynomial, uh, now, uh, the, when we do our factorization, as I say, we, we're going to get this other factor, potentially at least, um, capital Q, and this may contain uh, irreducible higher degree factors. So as a simple example of this, um, of what I mean by irreducible, I can take uh, this polynomial and I can factorize it in, in uh, F7, and I will find that uh, uh, X squared, uh, I will get a factor of X squared plus one. 
And uh, as we know that uh, seven is not of the form 4k plus one, I, I don't have a root of this polynomial, so I can't factor in any further. Okay, so our aim essentially in this case would be to get at the x plus four bit. Um, and uh, this is uh, a, <clears throat> um, uh, the fact that we can uh, start to do this and solve this in some generality is, is a very strong thing and is a quite an interesting property of finite fields. And uh, it follows uh, essentially from uh, Fermat's little theorem. Um, or, or what we're going to do here is uh, to, to start off with uh, Fermat's little theorem. Um, so uh, Fermat's little theorem provides us a very uh, useful polynomial um, where uh, of the form x to the p minus x. Um, and uh, this polynomial is, is really interesting because uh, we know that every, uh, polynom every element of the field is a root of this polynomial, which means that uh, this thing actually factorizes into the product over x minus a, where every uh, a is every element of the finite field. Um, and so uh, what we can uh, do uh, is, is to use this polynomial to build a, a slightly simpler polynomial uh, than our general Q of X, uh, which uh, has the same roots. Um, uh, the reason for this is that uh, what, we can, what we can do is to build this HQ, um, which uh, is the greatest common divisor of uh, Q of X and this uh, x to the p minus x polynomial. And because uh, so the greatest common divisor is basically looking at each uh, two polynomials and, and saying, uh, what are the shared factors? Um, and this uh, polynomial only has linear factors. Uh, so if I take the GCD of our original polynomial, um, then I'm only going to get something with the linear factors out. And because this polynomial has every uh, element of the field uh, as uh, a factor, x minus a as a factor, then I, I will get out every uh, root. Um, a, a, I will get out a polynomial which uh, uh, factors into x minus xi, where xi are the roots of, of q. So um, the polynomial GCD is, is, a, is a standard uh, algorithm. And, and uh, Mathematica, of course, has its own implementation, where, again, you can do it in a finite field with the modulus option. Um, so now I have uh, a, a polynomial, and I uh, essentially want to find uh, uh, its, uh, uh, its factors, right? Because if I can find its factors, then I can find, uh, and it only has linear factors, its factors will correspond to the roots. And we're going to use a, a trick, and this is a trick of uh, Cantor and Sassenhaus um, uh, for uh, splitting a polynomial. So uh, the, the idea is that we want to be a little bit looser than factorization and simply find uh, two polynomials, f and g, such that when I multiply them together, I get p. So this is kind of uh, one step of a factorization procedure, because if I repeat this, I will, uh, on, if I repeatedly split uh, what comes out, then I'm going to get all the way down to, to my factors. And to do this, we're going to, uh, use one of the uh, one of the theorems again from the first lecture where uh, specifically Euler's criterion. So um, what we're going to do is to take a, a random element of the finite field R and we're going to construct uh, a special polynomial um, which we'll call capital R of X. And uh, this is just X minus R raised to the P minus one over two minus one. Now, why have I done this? Well, the reason is that uh, we might remember that from Euler's criterion, uh, x some if I take an element of the field and I raise it to p minus one over two, uh, fifty percent of the time, if it's a quadratic residue, I get one. So what this is doing is uh, because R is random, it's mapping uh, every this polynomial sort of maps fifty percent of the elements of of the field to zero. So 50% of the elements of the field are a root of R of X. Okay. Um, 
And the important uh, observation and very non-trivial observation about this polynomial is that we can, we can use it in a, in a useful way by uh, dividing it by our polynomial here, P of X. Um, because uh, we, can, we can show that the remainder of uh, the division R of X by P of X actually shares roots um, with P of X. So uh, we, we're doing polynomial division. What, uh, you will know this uh, by now from Yang's course, that uh, what we're doing is we're taking our original polynomial and we're writing it in, in the following form, where we pick A such that RP of X is of the lowest possible degree. Um, and uh, so uh, this will then uh, give us a, a low degree uh, polynomial here, RP of X. Um, and this, again, is something that you can implement easily uh, in Mathematica in a finite field. Uh, very standard algorithms for this. But uh, we now hit the, the key point, okay, which is that if I take this equation and I evaluate it at uh, a root uh, xi of, of p of x, then this term just drops, okay? So we, we end up with the statement that r of xi is equal to rp of xi. Um, but we know that uh, r of xi with 50% probability is zero, okay? Because of uh, the way that we constructed this through Euler's criterion. And so with 50% probability, the polynomial that we just computed, RP of XI, actually has uh, XI as a root. So XI was a root of P and uh, it's also probabilistically a root of RP. Um, so how do we get this root out? Uh, then I mean this is a very nice uh, it's a very nice trick um, but so uh, let's look at uh, RP of X um, now this thing is uh, if we think about how it will factor it's going to give some uh, polynomial RP bar uh, multiplied by a uh, product of X minus XI where um, these XI uh, are coming from a subset of the roots of P um, because it's a subset because we have to work, we're working probabilistically and uh, only 50% uh, of the time are you going to get uh, each root. Uh, so if we want to find uh, a factor of, of P of X, um, what we need to do then is, is the same game from before and grab the, the common piece of P of X and, R, uh, and RP of X. Um, and in this way, the common piece is going to be a polynomial uh, with the, built from the shared set of roots. Um, and uh, so we, we build the, the, the greatest common divisor, um, g of x, and uh, the other factor will then be given to us by uh, polynomial division. Now, uh, if we do this, uh, because we're working probabilistically, it might well be that two uh, annoying cases happen. The first case is where we actually manage to build a polynomial that has every, every root of P of, of P of X. And so this is just the full set, uh, in which case you're just going to get the original polynomial back. Or uh, it will be that the, uh, G of X uh, will actually just be uh, a constant because it didn't share any of the polynomial, any of the roots. So we're just going to repeat the splitting uh, procedure until we find a proper factor. And, and in this way, uh, we are actually able to, to find the full set of uh, roots of, of Q of X, our original polynomial. So let's uh, go through the steps. The first thing that we do is to, to build this polynomial, which has the same roots by this uh, greatest common divisor um, algorithm. And then we're going to uh, use this splitting, uh, at using this uh, splitting algorithm to uh, split it into two factors, F and G. And then all we have to do is just uh, recurse this, uh, keep splitting F and G until we get to linear factors, and uh, those uh, 
uh, linear factors will correspond to, to the roots. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, in this way, uh, I've been able to dispel that there, there is no, no magic behind uh, Mathematica's solve command in a finite field. Uh, it's just doing this uh, set of probabilistic operations. Okay, so uh, this brings me to the end. Uh, and I'd just like to point to some places for further reading. Uh, if you want to learn uh, to, to find a place to dive into the literature on these functional reconstruction algorithms, uh, then you could perhaps take a look at the Firefly paper, um, which uh, also discusses some of the sparse algorithms that I mentioned. Um, and uh, for this uh, root solving setup, we can also think uh, back to uh, this uh, book, uh, Course in Computational Algebraic Number Theory. Um, so. Thank you very much. Are there any final questions? Uh, Manuel? Yeah. Hi, Ben. Thanks very much for Hi. a nice lecture series. Really appreciate it. Um, I was <laughs> wondering, so um, when we apply this functional reconstruction to the amplitudes cases, we will um need to use momentum to sort parameterization and the xi you use are this three n minus ten independent variables right so it's not mm. the spinors or the s's and this is yeah this is indeed how people do it in practice yeah so once you did this you actually want to convert this xi's back into spinors slash mandelstams right so my question is the only parameterization i know about is the one by simon badger or at least publicly and I was wondering if there is any other which allows you to directly convert the XIs into Mandelstams instead of, um, I think Simon's is a combination. So depending on which X you pick, but the ugliest one is kind of a rational function of the spinner of the spinner brackets. So it's not very kind of nice if you want to write things in terms of Mandelstam's. Is there a way of directly doing this or is there maybe even a formal obstruction to possibly do this? Because it just seem, seems very complicated to me, but in principle, being the XI holistically blind, I don't see why you could not do this kind of. Yeah, so um, the these twisted variables, um, the, the, the way that they're cho chosen in some sense is that you've gone into a frame in, in Twister space. And so uh, you've, you've made a choice. Um, and uh, that, that choice may well, may well be, be ugly. Um, and then when you, you map back, uh, so, so you, you can map back just by basically um, uh, computing the various spinner brackets and uh, trying to solve the uh, polynomial equations that relate the spinner brackets to the twisted variables. Um, this has not really been, uh, how to do this well has not really been uh, explored, uh, I would say. That's, that's the reason why uh, you, you find Simon's paper and uh, moving, sorry, moving, do this well at higher multiplicities or in, in other cases. And so, um, uh, to go back to uh, Mandelstam's uh, is, or, or even the spinners is often uh, an algebraic procedure. Uh, in practice, um, one of the ways that uh, we, uh, we have gone from, uh, say, the twisted variables to the Mandelstam variables is actually to set up another functional reconstruction procedure um, where uh, you, you end up taking the, the Mandelstams as independent variables and you sample the twister um, variable function. Um, this does require a bit of thinking on a case-by-case -case basis. So I, I would say that there's, there's not necessarily a general solution for this yet. And so you can, you can sample on the Mandelstams and reconstruct the, the X size inverting this? No, not exactly. Uh, and the reason for this is that the X size, uh, the twister variables and the spinners are chiral. Um, so uh, they 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 take into account the fact that like uh, you know there's there's parity as an operation. You have to make a choice, um, the, right? Uh, not not just this, but um, the the uh, if you take a function uh, built out of twisted variables and you uh, 
evaluate it on say two phase space points, one being the chiral conjugate of the original, you will get a different value. But if I have a function of uh, sijs, this will not be the case. So uh, the thing that you have to the, say in the five point case that you have to do is, is also add um, uh, trace five uh, to, to your setup. Um, and this will han handle the uh, chirality. Um, and, and then uh, in practice, what you uh, can do is essentially average over the two uh, parity uh, com uh, configurations when you do your sampling to get uh, parity, uh, two parity even functions. Uh, so if you imagine that you have uh, your function being uh, F of Mandelstam's plus TR5 times G of Mandelstam's, then by sampling over um, two parity conjugate points, you can uh, extract an evaluation of F and G on, uh, on this phase space point. And in that way, you can, uh, you can go back to, to Mandelstam's. Um, and this in practice uh, is uh, faster than uh, any way I've managed to implement uh, just, just simple algebra in Mathematica for doing the mapping back. I see. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, is, is there any urgent question? We are somewhat over time and into the break. So, uh, OK, uh, I don't see uh, anyone else. Maybe I scared them a little bit there. Um, but uh, so I just like to say thank you very much for your attention. It's been a great time and uh, best of luck with the project. Yeah, let's uh, everyone um, unmute ourselves for a second and give Ben a, a nice round of applause for all three lectures.